So if you don't have those, would you just raise, raise your hands? Raise your hands on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. All right, well, let me lead us in prayer, and then we'll get started. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us to this place tonight. Thank you for all the things that you're doing in our life together as we gather on Wednesday night. I pray for our children and teenagers as they're gathering in their, their places, learning about your word and, and growing in their walks with you. Thank you for all the different Bible studies that are happening all over uh, this building. And Lord, I pray that in uh, each gathering, uh, groups that are meeting in big groups, small groups, everything in between, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would uh, move, that believers would be strengthened, uh, that the lost who are here tonight would uh, would be moved into a, a fellowship with you, and that you would um, you would use tonight to further the process of conforming us into the image of your Son. Uh, help us not to lose track of, of the fact that that's the point. Not to just learn a little more, not to just have a, a few more uh, factoids piled up. Uh, in our memory banks, but, but uh, the point is that we would be more and more like Jesus together uh, because we've been underneath your word. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the gift of the, uh, the letters to the Thessalonians. I uh, pray that you would help us understand uh, these letters a bit better tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Excuse me. Well, we are indeed looking at uh, the letters to the Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to look at the, the nifty thing about uh, First and Second Thessalonians is uh, it's one of the places where we have a pretty good amount of detail in the Book of Acts about the church uh, in Thessalonica, and so not every single one of Paul's letters, like his letter to the Colossians, we don't have any Colossians information in the Book of Acts, uh, but we do have uh, a great deal of information, uh, or, or comparatively, a good amount of information about uh, uh, the city of Thessalonica and Paul's ministry. <clears throat> the other thing to take note of is the there is just a few weeks that, that transpired between Paul's planting of the church uh, in Thessalonica and uh, the letters that he writes. And then there is just a few weeks between his first letter and his second letter. So all this data that we have in the New Testament is real close together, and I do think it helps us to have a deeper understanding of the letters because we have very relevant information in Acts. And I want to encourage you to do that. One of the ways that I'm teaching through this New Testament survey is we are teaching it chronologically so that you can, you can marry Acts and Paul's letters together because I just think that's a good thing to keep in mind. And so... <coughs> Excuse me, I still have not lost my COVID call, so hopefully I'll cut that out in a second. Um, so last week we looked at Galatians, which I believe, and I think a good case can be made, that Galatians is the oldest letter of Paul's that we have. And then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are the next oldest. So these would have been the next letters that Paul wrote. Paul wrote uh, Galatians in probably 48 AD, and then he writes uh, Thessalonians in probably 50, 51 AD. AD. All right, so that is Paul is probably 38 to 40 years old when he's writing these letters and when he was, he was on this missionary journey. And this is, uh, y'all help me with the math. If Jesus died in 33 and this letter is being written in 48, how many years after the book? 15. This is 15 years after the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And I just always think it's thinking that it's good to hold the proximity of all those days in your mind. I mean, all of us in this room have, have a pretty good sense of how long it takes for 15 years to go by. Not that long. And, and unbelievable things are taking place. And so I, I, I've reminded you several times, but I'll remind you again, what, what we have in Paul's writings are uh, 80 pages totality of all of his writings are 80 pages. And then this occurred to me as I was preparing today. The length of Paul's ministry was probably about 16 years. 
That's probably from the time Paul went to Antioch, was invited to go to Antioch after he had spent 10 years in Tarsus, kind of putting himself in his own personal seminary, to the time that he's martyred under Emperor Nero in, uh, in Rome. It's about 16 years. 80 pages and 16 years. And here we are 2,000 years later talking about something that in the grand scheme of human history is a, is, is a blip. And a couple of things to take note about that. One is God can do more in a couple of minutes than you can do under your own steam in a thousand lifetimes. And so that helps us to remember always be careful about the day. Always be careful about the, the day. You've been given this day, and we tend to think that the day is, uh, you know, not that significant. You may look back on the events of your day today, and you went to Walmart, or you got something at the uh, Home Depot, or whatever it is, and in the grand scheme of all that's gone on, on in the world, you wouldn't think that was much. But if in one of those trips to the store, you have a conversation that helps point someone to Jesus, you have no idea where that conversation is going to go. Um, does anybody remember how uh, uh, D.L. Moody, one of the great evangelists of, of Christian history, he would, be, he would be the Billy Graham of the 1800s. Anybody remember how he got saved? He was a shoe salesman. And his boss, who was a layman and, a, and just, just was the manager of the shoe store, showed, showed the gospel to him. <clears throat> and invited him to Sunday school. D.L. Moody was so ignorant of, of anything having to do with Christianity that he it took him three tries to be allowed to join the church. <laughs> <laughs> and Edward Kimball was the guy's name. We don't know. We don't really know anything else about Edward, Edward Kimball's life, but that one conversation on that one day. That maybe in his diary said, uh, Try to share the gospel with this ignorant, dirty, uneducated, low-level clerk. Not sure what happened. You know? So anyway, I don't want to chase that around too much further. But just keep that in mind. That what, what Paul was able to accomplish uh, during his lifetime in those 16 years. And then how those 16 years and 80 pages, here we are on another continent. 2,000 years later, still talking about it and still being blessed by it. So, always keep the proximity of all those things in mind. So, real quick, so in Acts 16 and 17, you have uh, the recounting of the beginning of what's known as the second missionary journey. One of the things you want to remember is uh, Galatians was written during the first missionary journey, or, or at the end, after the first missionary journey is over, and before the second missionary journey has begun. So Galatians is, is written in, and then um, Thessalonians is written during the second missionary journey. All right, so Second Thessalonians is written during the second missionary journey. Does anybody know what is uh, unique, interesting, significant about the second missionary journey? What what big thing happens in the second missionary journey? So it's just a geographical question. During the first missionary journey, where was Paul's activity concentrated. Due north of Jerusalem. Right, right. So it's it's if you want to go around the corner <clears throat> on the Mediterranean Sea, it's just around the corner. That's Antioch, and then he worked in that area, somewhat near his home area of Tarsus, uh, and beyond in the region of Galatia. All right, so that would have been southwest Turkey, and now it's just a couple of hours car ride from Antioch. So Paul was working fairly geographically close to his hometown and to Antioch, and that's where he stayed. Then the second missionary journey, <coughs> Paul sets out, and um, things start to go wrong. What's the first thing that went wrong in Paul's uh, missionary, second missionary journey? Remember? He and Barnabas get crossways with each other. <clears throat> and they got more. They split. And so in this second missionary journey, uh, um, Paul goes with Silas. And he's, he's going his own way. And then what the scriptures tell 
was I mean, oh, and he picks up Timothy, so that's a highlight. He picks up Timothy, who had come to faith during the first missionary journey in Lystra. Paul picks up Timothy. And it's interesting. Uh, make sure that he goes to the rite of circumcision. So this is after Paul's done all of this arguing about the fact that you do not have to become, uh, you do not have to get circumcised, you don't have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. That's what that whole first missionary journey and the letter to the Galatians and that whole fight that he gets into with Peter uh, is all over that. And then one of the first things that he does on the second missionary journey is he has Timothy, who's half Jew, half Gentile, uh, make sure that he's circumcised. Why, why do you think Paul does that? Does that seem inconsistent? Why, why would Paul, who doesn't have Titus circumcised in Jerusalem, he takes that trip to Jerusalem, doesn't have Titus go through the rite of circumcision, but he, he does have Timothy. Any thoughts about that? Is it a testing to see like he really was in Jesus? Like, I'll, I'll do this because I am. Okay, it could be a test of commitment. Certainly, certainly would be a test of commitment, that's for sure. <laughs> Why not? Is Paul, was Paul just being inconsistent? Father. It, tell me a little more about that. His father being Greek. Okay, all right. Father being father. He's, so he's sort of, that's right. Okay. What else? Well, I'm going to give you a little tip of where I'm trying to go. What was Paul's habit Oh, and we call it, this is your seminary, where it's called missiology. Missiology is just your things having to do with how you're going to do your missionary work. And so when Paul would go from town to town, how did he do his missionary work? Go to the synagogue first. Go to the synagogue first, right? And that's just, and that would continue to be his approach for the rest of his life. And certainly is what he's arguing for when he writes the letter to the Romans many years later, six or seven years. Cut down objection when he goes to seminary. That's right. I mean, some doctors got Timothy with him. That's right. So, uh, and, I, and here's one of the things that I want you to see in the second missionary journey, and then what Paul starts to encounter as he as he goes to this new area is the, the the level of persecution and Jewish opposition is going to intensify, and. Paul doesn't want to have anything that's not necessary to, to the gospel get in the way. And so, uh, and I forget where it says it, but he says to, to Jews, I'm a Jew, to Greeks, I'm a Greek, to those under the law, I'm under the law. I'm not going to do anything that's going to be a barrier uh, to me uh, presenting the gospel. And I would give you this analogy. I was in Peru doing some mission work, and it was an area where Seventh-day Adventism was real, had, had was, was a lot of people were Seventh Day Adventists, <clears throat> and Seventh Day Adventists, kind of one of their main things is, is they think we should you should have church on Saturday. And so we're trying to do some missionary work, and the Seventh Day Adventist comes out to me and says, "Well, before we get into all this other stuff, I need this church. I didn't even know is church supposed to be on Saturday or church is church supposed to be on Sunday." And what I said at that moment is, "It really doesn't matter because we're here to talk about Jesus. We can talk about the Saturday Sunday thing." You can't more get sidetracked into a into a less important theological issue and miss Jesus. Because really that's what was happening. Is, is they all of these discussions have leaked down into non-Jesus issues, and Paul wants to clear out everything so that he can proclaim the gospel. Okay? So I think that's the main reason uh, that he has Timothy circumcised, uh, even though he does not believe that. That a Gentile has to take on the wall. All right, so he heads off into the second missionary journey. What I, and, and what you see there uh, <coughs> is uh, difficulty. There's been the break with Barnabas, and then you, you'll read. I won't read it to you in the interest of time tonight. But Paul will say the Holy Spirit prevented us from going to Asia. The Holy Spirit was preventing us. You, you almost get a sense that what Paul is trying to do, and Asia is going to uh, Galatia is south. East um, Turkey and Asia is Southwest Turkey. So if you if you wonder what those regions meant back then, and the heartbeat of ancient Asia was Ephesus, and you get a sense that what Paul wants is Paul wants to go to Ephesus. He thinks that's the next the next big opportunity is there at Ephesus. But the Holy Spirit starts to push them. And he wants to go 
west, maybe even southwest. And the Holy Spirit starts to push them northward. So Paul says, so we tried to go to Mysia, and then the Holy Spirit prevented us from going to Mysia. Well, Mysia is up on the Black Sea. So Paul was going due north, where there's some opportunities were. Now, here you geography nerds can really just let me know. Why do you think Paul wanted to go either due west or due north? What, what's going on in central Turkey? Nothing. <laughs> there ain't nothing in central Turkey. There still ain't nothing in central Turkey. It's a rocky desert. Barren wasteland. And Paul, in his logic, is probably thinking, well, <clears throat> there's nothing there. Why does the Holy Spirit seem to be directing us into the Mojave Desert? And so there's some wandering, and, and it says, uh, if I can find it. Um, so, uh, verse 6 they passed through uh, the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia after they came. Uh, they were uh, trying to uh, go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And Luke gives us that, and he's like, well, they, they went to they went to Robertsdale, and then they went to Loxley, and then they couldn't, you know, and they, 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 they couldn't get to Bagdad. This is, this is, they went to uh, West Virginia, and then they went to Maine. This is all by foot. These are the orders of magnitude of of the wandering, and, it, it, and from all appearances, no church work really is going on, they're having no success, and there really is this sense almost of a wilderness wandering. And I got this idea from N.T. Wright is speculating, and I think we, we <clears throat> Luke doesn't tell us whose fault it was that Paul and Barnabas got mad at each other, but history seems to indicate that Paul had been the one who blew it. And it's almost like because Paul got down in the flesh and started doing what he wanted, he got mad at Barnabas, and we're not taking Luke and all this sort of stuff. I think he had almost lost his way. There's this sense. Or he's trying to, trying to, he seems, he seems to have lost his way a bit. And so the Holy Spirit is directing them um, all the way. So Troas is up near the Hellespont, it's, it's up near Istanbul and where, where Turkey and uh, and then uh, the, the west of the touch. <coughs> and Troas is really, uh, at this time in the first century, sort of a rinky ding, dying little place. It's, it's, it's a port city, but it, it used to be great, but it wasn't anymore. And probably even to Troas. Um, and so now it's Paul and Silas and Timothy and, and Luke, because you start to see the we in here. So Luke has joined them as well. And they're probably all in Troas thinking, what are we doing? And, and it likely has been months uh, that they've been making their way here. It's probably a little winter time. And then Paul has this vision. Um, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia and conclude that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so, before Paul gets this vision of the man of Macedonia, what do you think Paul had been thinking with respect to his missionary work in Europe? He had been. I think to Paul, a, a, a Palestinian and Eastern M Roman Empire kind of guy, to Paul, Europe would have been Mars. I just don't, I, it was beyond what his worldview and where a guy like Paul might end up. And I just think he thought, Europe, that's, I probably won't be the guy that, that does that. I'm, I'm probably not going to be asking that. There's a, there's a lot of work to do right where I am. And then he gets a vision. It doesn't come from Paul, but it comes from God. And I'm sure once again, just like the vision of Jesus that he got on the road to Damascus, it was, oh, and I think Paul probably thought, God, are you serious? We're going to take this good news to Europe. We're going to take this, because Europe is where Athens is, and Europe is where Rome is. What, what, what strikes he had the vision, 
after that to go to Spain. Mm -hmm. And I think, so God gives him this vision to go to Spain knowing that's never going to, uh, I don't guess that ever happened. I don't know if it happened or not. Well, and, and it's, it's so interesting. It's why heaven's going to be so much fun because we get to find out. It's tantalizing to know. There's a, <coughs> there seems to be some indication that from the time the book of Acts ends and Paul is under arrest in Rome, but tradition says he is martyred under Nero. But Nero is not the emperor when Paul goes to Rome. And so you've got this several year interval. And so there is some speculation that Paul did. He either made it to Spain or he made it west of Rome. And then somehow got, got caught up in a persecution brought back to Rome and killed. But, but to your point, it's this. I think from that point forward, Paul's understanding was, oh, when you said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, other most parts of the world, God, you weren't whistling Dixie. You, you, you really intend for this world-saving gospel to actually save the world. I get to go to India. I don't know if we'll say India, but ignore that on the video. Um, it, Southeast Asia. I'm going in a, uh, about six weeks or so. And one of the things that we're going to get to do, um, along with our missionary work, is I get to go to the place where William Carey landed and first started his missionary work. And William Carey, the Baptist, started what's known as the Modern Mission Movement. Up to that point, there was little, no interest. If there was any interest in missions, it was among the Roman Catholics. Uh, and they tended to use the sword a lot when they did their mission work. Um, and William Carey is a shoemaker in England. And he cannot quit thinking about the Great Commission. And so he packs up his things. And here's a little uh, encouragement for you. Do you know what William Carey and his little uh, ministry team packed their things in? Their coffins. Ooh. Do you know how many wives he had? Do what? He? Do you know how many wives? Well, he, I mean, the wife he took didn't. God love her, didn't make it. She lost her mind. Uh, the, 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 she, had, she was just this little in, English kind of girl. And uh, it, she was overwhelmed by it. But, but the point is this. That going to India <clears throat> was for, for a uh, shoemaker, a cobbler, was like getting on a rocket ship and going to Mars. But William Carey believed that call. And William Carey believed that call because... Um, the Apostle Paul believed that call. And when the Apostle Paul was doing his work, England was Mars, right? But pretty quickly after Paul's death, the gospel would get to England uh, and, and win that part of the world to Christ. Anyway, keep chasing rabbits and I'll get more information here. So, but, the, but one of the things I want you to, to, to see is this process uh, that, that, uh, that the Lord uses to bring Paul very geographically far away from where he intended to go, and frankly, very geographically far from Jerusalem. And so Paul is going to be encountering Jews who, man, they are out in the, on the outposts. And what you find when people are trying to maintain their identity in outpost sort of scenarios, those folks are hardcore. So you got hardcore Jews in Europe. They're a long way from Jerusalem. They got a lot of pagans around them, and they're serious about being Jews. And then you just have a lot of pagans. And the closer you get to Rome, the more Roman the Romans are, the more committed to Rome the Romans are, and the more committed to the religion of Rome the Romans are. And so you're going to find higher degrees of persecution but also this unbelievable response to the gospel. And so Paul's going into these places and he's preaching Jesus to people who've never heard anything like it before. And what Paul will say to these Thessalonians is, in 1 Thessalonians 1, I came and I preached and you turned from, from your house to the living God. And, and everything changed. But that's going to be that dynamic. Paul's far from home the gospel. So there's difficulty, uh, there's distance, 
Uh, and then what you'll also see in this, that's, and I'm giving you things that are unique about, um, about, about the Thessalonian letters, is um, devotion. You'll see in Philippians, so before Paul goes to Thessalonica, he goes to Philippi. And we have Philippians, and we have the letters to the Thessalonians. And, and the letters to the Thessalonians and the letters to the Philippians of all of Paul's letters are the, have the most sense of devotion. 60% of 1 Thessalonians is really spent, well, Paul, with nearly all of his letters, he'll write a prayer report and thanksgiving. That's how his letters begin. I thank my God, and because of your faith, it's being reported among you, blah, blah, blah. You know, you get that, get that part. That part is about 60% of the of the of, of first Thessalonians. It's just this fond affection, this love, deep love for uh, uh, these believers. And Philippians is the same way. Philippians is just one long thank you note. Uh, and and it's it's a it's a very very personal and affectionate uh, uh, letters. And another thing that I want to uh, for that to help you with is <clears throat> we tend to think of Paul as sort of a, a, a mean guy, as a guy who was hard to get along with, a guy who liked to pick fights. But you see in these letters uh, a, a man who was was uh, sensitive. Caring and loving, uh, and had fond affection for people. Yeah, one of the episodes he, he goes down the boat, the, fan, the people of the town go down there, they're all, they're they're all, all crying. crying. Yep. They get yep. Yep. That's an Ephesus where he's telling them goodbye for the last time. Yeah, yeah they they loved it, and he loved he loved them. <clears throat> and it's good to be reminded we ought to have a fond, warm affection for one another. So, uh, so that's what's going on. And then the gospel ministry in uh, uh, Thessalonica is in chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Uh, and uh, y'all read that. I'm, I'm, I was going to do it, but I'm not going to do that tonight. But one thing that tells us is that he's there for three weeks, for, for three Sabbaths. He, he argues and, and, and preaches the gospel in the synagogue. And what it says is that some Jews and lots of Greeks come to faith. It's interesting because what will happen in Berea, the next town that he goes to, lots of Jews get saved. But in this town, in Thessalonica, there's a, there's a, you can tell that the Jews in this town are hardcore. How else do we know? This is a little bonus uh, trivia moment. How else do you know that the Jews in Thessalonica are hardcore? They're more noble than the other place. Well, what it's, it's, it's in Berea, it says they're more noble. And it's actually Jews from Thessalonica who are so aggravated with Paul and the gospel, they actually go down to Berea and cause trouble. It's the only report that we ever have of, of, of the angry Jews in one city going to the next city to snuff it out. And so there's this stunning opposition that's unique to, uh, to Thessalonica. Very jealous Jews. And the jealous Jews, it says, they cause an uproar. They basically start rioting in the city. They tear up Jason's house. I don't know, know exactly who Jason was. Maybe he was the leader of the synagogue. But he's, uh, so he's, he's offered uh, hospitality. And they tear things up. <coughs> and then you need to look at the charge that's given. Because this is also very instructive for understanding the letters. Verse 6 of chapter 17. It says, when they did not find him, so they're, they are looking for Paul and Silas and Timothy uh, to beat them up. This, these are the Jews, and they can't find him. They began dragging uh, Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, Saying there is, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They start with the crowd, the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, that means basically they had maybe posted bail, uh, they released them. So you have in this charge, uh, it's a, it's both a, it's both Jewish opposition and Gentile opposition, because they're preaching King Jesus, and there really is only, there's only one king. In, in, in Macedonia, and that's that's Caesar. So they're being accused of sedition, and 
And these would be crimes that are punishable by death or at least a bad beating, which is what Paul had gotten in Philippi just a few days before. It's another thing that I just always want to remind you of as well is Paul had been beaten with rods in Philippi. Remember that? When put in jail, the Philippian jail, all of that. This, this was just days before he, before he actually went to go to so maybe a couple of weeks. And I think one of the unique things about Paul's ministry, and this will really probably shows up in his, uh, in his letters and his trouble with the Corinthian church. What do you think Paul looked like when he showed up in Thessalonica? He was beaten with rods. They're like dow rods, about that long. And they're intended to uh, basically create hematomas. They don't break the skin, but they bust all of the veins underneath. And when they beat you, they just beat you black and blue. And so Paul shows up looking like, because Paul will say very often, I was preaching in my weakness, in my weakness you love me anyway. And one of the things the Corinthians will struggle with is, is why are we preaching a crucified Messiah and why are we, why do we have a teaching that brings us into persecution? We, we want a religion like all these other philosophies that make, make everything great for us. Paul says to the Corinthians, I, I came knowing one thing among you, and that's Christ and crucified. So, anyway, uh, there is this, so you see once again the authorities in the city are organized, they're serious, there is no distance they won't go to to bring about opposition. And so what you're going to see, one of the very, one of the, uh, as we get to the theology of, of Paul uh, as he heads into the, to Thessalonica and then as he writes the letters, um, <clears throat> one of those major themes is going to be persecution. The uh, instruction for the church uh, for, and to the Thessalonians speaks very specifically to encouragement under very severe persecution. All right? So, um, one of the things to always remember, then we back up a little bit as we think about Paul's theology. Paul's theology always is rooted in three dynamics. Monotheism, election, and eschatology. Those are the three big areas. Monotheism, election, and eschatology. Paul is going to be preaching the one God. The one God. And he will say to the Thessalonians, you turn, turn from all of your fake gods, all of your foreign gods, all of your multiple gods, to the one true and living God. And for Paul, the one God is also the one Lord Jesus Christ. And the one spirit uh, that's being poured out. And so it's a Trinitarian oneness, but Paul is preaching uh, the oneness of God and the fact that Israel's God is the Savior of the whole world. And so everything you're looking for is found in this one God. Monotheism. And so, as a good Jew, the Jews never really learned monotheism until they went into exile. They always struggled with that idolatry thing. But they came out of exile being very serious about there being only one God. And then the explosion that happened in Paul's mind on the road to Damascus is he realized that one God that he was affirming was Jesus. Okay? So, seriousness about monotheism and then election. Now, there's a whole theological argument about election, predestination, and all that, that sort of stuff. And I'm going to tell you as someone who, and if you want to do this at some point, I can wear everybody out about predestination and election. I've written the book, and I can give you all kinds of discussion about the Reformation discussion concerning election. But one of my fundamental discoveries as I've studied this issue is that all of that really misses the point of biblical election. Biblical election is a fairly simple idea, uh, and it's and it's a uh, it's a uh, has to do with salvation history. All of humankind has lost its way, and they need to be rescued. And so God chooses a people, and then within that people, He chooses a Messiah to rescue the whole world. And so. Uh, Chosenness is not I choose some and not others. That is not a biblical election. Biblical election is I choose some for the rest. I choose some for the rest. And that is always the, the trajectory of Paul's teaching on, uh, on election and on 
The first place that election appears is Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul, where God says, Abraham, I've chosen you. So that through you, everyone else can, uh, can come to find redemption that comes <clears throat> from God and God alone. God doesn't choose Abraham and say, man, Abraham, you hit the jackpot because it's you and nobody else. And he doesn't say to Israel, I've chosen you and no other nations. <clears throat> right? So, uh, and, and so for Paul, and so Paul will talk to the, and, and, and speak specifically to the Thessalonians about the fact that they're chosen. He uses that word specifically in the first chapter. But, but let's, now that you've heard what you've heard, this mostly Gentile church, a gajillion miles from Jerusalem, and Paul calls them elect. What's really actually stunning about that declaration? What, what, would have, what do you think that pagan, previously pagan slave girl would have thought when Paul directed the word chosen to her? That's just a distant and far. I mean, me. Yeah. yeah. That's right. You're special. God's been searching for you and looking for you, arranging all the history for you. And everything true of Israel is true of you, for you. And everything true of Jesus has been given to you. And you are a daughter of the King. I've been looking for you. And I found you. And I was willing to do anything. I crossed the AGMC to get to you. And you're special. It's not an accident. Because here's, here's, here's what they often tried to accuse Paul of. He's just Johnny come lately and he's, he's just made up this whole new rendition of things. And, and this is some uh, uh, late to the table idea about who God is. And Paul's whole point, one of the side points that he wants to teach in election is this was the plan all along. This was the plan all along. And how do you know it was the plan all along? Because Genesis 12 says it. This is all the families of the earth finding their blessing in Abraham's seed. It's, it's happening. It's actually happening. And so, so for Paul, it's an election that results in a church. This Jew, Gentile, unexpected family of the Messiah that's bursting onto the scene. And then eschatology. Eschatology just is a fancy word for end times, or the doctrine of the end times. And how Paul moves from monotheism to election to eschatology, he says, is that this one God who has chosen this Messiah people, the Messiah people is putting on display all that is to come. And so if you want a taste of what new creation is going to look like, which is a part of God's project for fixing the world, blessing the world, bringing the world to its ultimate completion. That's, that's been the plan all along. And God's doing that through his people. And when you see Christians and the way they love and treat one another, you see new creation on display. And when you see people growing in the Lord, it changes the way that they, they live their lives and conduct themselves. Then the world starts to, the old world has a chance to see the new world. And so for Paul, the idea that the, that the old world is passing away and the new world is invading at the same time, that's on, the, that's on the front edge of Paul's thinking at all times. And although religion was something he was combating, they were philosophies and stuff like that, but this is based on the historical fact. Yeah, it really is. It's an event that occurred and a resurrection that occurred. Right. And that's a great catch because what's interesting is the next, essentially the next, Paul goes to Berea, uh, and then he winds up in Athens, and he preaches to the philosophers, and he's, he's putting... Gospel, the gospel in, a, in sort of a language they can understand. So he talks about their philosophers, but then he gives them a historical detail, which is what resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And they're like, ah, you know, can't, can't go there with you. Um, uh, as long as we like to hear philosophical ideas, uh, we don't want to hear that the ages have turned. But if you ask Paul to sum it all up for you, he would be as likely as anything to say, in Jesus the ages have turned. When he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, the resurrected Christ, and as, a, and as the resurrected Christ, what Jesus' resurrection says is, the new world has broken into the old world. The new world 
the other side of death world has busted into this world. And, and almost like an infection, it is invading this world. It is radiating out from Jesus to his people. And as they share the gospel, out, out flows this new creation and, and it pushes the old creation back. And that started when Jesus came out of that tomb. In Jesus, the ages of time. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an inauguration of a, a plan that will come to fruition uh, on the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, when, when everything's said and done. So, Paul's going to talk about monotheism. Paul's going to talk about ele election in the letter to the Thessalonians. And Paul's going to talk a lot about eschatology. And you almost get a sense that, that, that in um, Paul's preaching, his discussion of the return of Christ was a prominent feature of his preaching. Because the, the Thessalonians are actually trying to figure out how to put all of that together. And so all of these things are giving an answer to persecution. I don't know about you, but I have my biggest problems with God when things are not going my way. Okay. I'm surprised. You'd be surprised at how little I'll fuss when everything's like I want it to. I'm the most faithful person you ever met. Man, I'm loving on some God, you know, when everything is just happening like I want it to happen. But man, I get hurt. Someone near me gets hurt. Something happens that I don't like, disappoints me, or I feel betrayed, or on the list goes on. Then I start to have questions. I think we can all identify. The great thing about our God is he loves to meet us there. Right in the midst of it. And so Paul is running from persecution and these, these new Christians, these three-week-old Christians. Now, can you imagine it? It's a church filled with three-week-old Christians who get a knock at their door and there's either an angry Jewish friend or an angry Roman friend or an angry Roman police officer who says, now I've heard your Caesar, and we've noticed that you're not showing up at any of our um, sacred feasts for uh, Apollo. And you know, if you don't show up for the sacred feast of Apollo, God might send, Apollo might send, he might talk to Neptune and send a tsunami to smash us. And so you need to, you need to be down here at these, at these celebrations because you're putting the whole city at risk. And these three-week-old Christians say, can't do it. I don't believe that anymore. There's not, there's not really a net to mm -hmm. there's, there's only one God. This does not go over me in the first century. <clears throat> and so you're out of our trade guild. Uh, don't come to work tomorrow. Uh, give me my grandchildren and my daughter. Come back to my house. Uh, if you're a slave, maybe the head of the household says, let's just take him out back, run him through, don't let the garbage. It's, there we, there we are. And they've got a decision to make. And what, is, is, uh, what appears to be the case is here these three week old baby Christians are trusting Jesus and telling the truth and whatever happens next is what's supposed to happen so that even some of them are dying. And I think that's what Paul is talking about when he says some of them have already died and they're concerned about fellow believers who've already died and maybe they're going to miss uh, the chance to, uh, to meet the Lord on, on the day of the Lord. I don't think they died because they were persecuted. And so as you think about Thessalonians, you think about teaching, and one, that's one of the things you ought to remind yourself and remind those you're teaching. These are three-week-old Christians that are facing death. It's no surprise that the 
the old world objects to the proclamation and the invasion of the new world and persecution is going to be a part of that and what again is new creation about this uh, uh, this message of Jesus is what is the Christian's response to the threat of persecution what, is, what, what does the Christian do when they're threatened what does a non-Christian do when they're threatened run, run or Punch somebody in the mouth, right? <laughs> but the way of Jesus is to not fight or run. It's just to say, I love you. And you, know, you do whatever you think you, you, you do whatever you think you need to do because I'm going to do whatever I what I need to do in Christ. And um, I've, I've told you all this before. Uh, there's a a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn was was um, in the Soviet gulags during the during the terrible time of Soviet rule, and he's an atheist and and, and really a communist. But suddenly, because they were always told people in the gulag for one thing or another, he started to notice that from time to time these little uh, Russian babushkas, that's a little Russian grandma, would get get put in the gulag, and but he's Noticed a pattern that eventually they they send the, send the babushka back. They just send her home. And so I tried to find out why that was the case. And it's because these little ladies would be, would be pulled in to be interrogated and, 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 and threatened and, and, and eventually broken. And the, the goal was to break them to get them to deny the existence of God or, or whatever it was. And these these uh, mature Christian ladies would say, you know, I'm just. I'm just not going to deny Jesus. And so you just got to do whatever, do whatever it is you're going to do. And they would say, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you know, we're going to pull your fingernails off. You know, hey, do whatever it is you, you got to do. And they found that um, that faith was so powerful that keeping those ladies in the, in the gulag would cause everyone else to stand up <laughs> against the communists. My point is there is this unstoppable power of righteous suffering. There's an unstoppable power in righteous suffering. And that's what Paul is calling the people uh, of, of, of this new little church to do. And so uh, that's his theology. And then I already touched on this, but his practice was to go to the synagogue first. That's what he does in, in, um, in uh, Thessalonica and then on to the pagans from there. And so, uh, real quickly, the city of, of Thessalonica is uh, right on the coast. Uh, I think the, now I can't remember the name of it. There's a little gulf. It's on the Aegean Sea. Now I can't remember the name of it, but it was a, uh, Philippi was a pretty big city. Thessalonica was a big, very important city. Very old, very Roman. At the crossroads of the north-south and an east-west trade route. Uh, very critical for uh, and important as a place from which the gospel go out to the whole world. And so Paul mentions to them, your, your faith is being made known everywhere because people were screaming in and out of that city, north, south, east, and west. Um, and as I've, already gone, oh, as I've already gone over, there's, there was a, a tough crowd in the synagogue, great response among the Gentiles. Serious persecution of the Jews and the Romans, so much so that they followed uh, Paul and Silas to, to Berea. And so uh, then let's look at the text itself. So Paul goes to Berea, and then he goes on, and eventually gets to Athens. He's in Athens a little while, and then he goes on to Corinth. It was probably from Corinth that Paul wrote the letters uh, to, to the, uh, first and second Thessalonians. Uh, and so nearly every chapter in both letters mentions or addresses coming of the Lord. So you have that strong uh, sense of, of end times and eschatology uh, and the, the importance of affirming that one day uh, Christ will return, uh, judge the quick and the dead, and bring the new creation. So as you're teaching and learning about Thessalonians, one of the things to keep in mind is that's probably the, the most critical doctrinal theme is the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, end times, eschatology, those uh, sorts of things. All right. Um, uh, 
the, the way that manifests itself is Christ and his kingdom will one day displace the kingdoms of this world. Um, and, and another aspect of that that Paul's going to talk about is we can be absolutely certain of the event. It's one of the things uh, that, that Paul is, is uh, teaching and reinforcing with the Thessalonians. And what he says to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is, comfort one another with these words. One of the things that will help you with the fear of persecution, he says, is that Jesus is going to put all this right one day. All of this is going to be set right by him. And Jesus is paying attention. What Paul will say to them in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians is, um, Jesus is going to come and he's going to take care of these people who hurt you. He's going to come. He comes. His second coming is as the judge. And those who have lived and loved the darkness, they will... They're going to answer, and that's also something I would, would remind you about as well. Some, sometimes we want to we want to exact revenge. What does Jesus say about revenge? In the, not Jesus. What does Paul say about revenge in the Book of Galatians? He quotes the Scripture and says, "God says vengeance is mine." You'll do a better job. He'll do a much, much, much better job because he's much, much, much more qualified. And we say that, we all know that phrase, but I would really encourage you, you need to, to, to rest in and live in that. Because I, I carry a grudge now. And I can have my little fantasy. Watch him, I see that guy. That's, that's in the Lord's hands. That holds you back when you keep that grudge. Woo -hoo. That, that holds you back from, from uh, doing it. So when you let all that go, he's like, he said, you let it go, and I'll, I'll straighten him out in a way. It's drinking poison. Expecting it to make the other person sick. Don't you love that? That's what that's what grudges, bitterness, drinking poison. Expecting it to make the other, other person sick. Yeah, Gary. So I was looking at the map. Fun fact: Thessaloniki was named after Alexander the Great's sister. Yes, very good. Uh, in case you're on Jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, hey, there you got it. Um, that's. Alexander the Great's sister. That's right. Um, so, Paul is giving them encouragement about the certainty of Christ's return. But he's also uh, making sure they understand that they do not need to get um, anxious about the details concerning his return. And so, uh, the problem, we'll talk about this in just a second, in 2 Thessalonians is... is Somebody has come along and said, Jesus has already returned. He's, he's already come back. And you missed it. So they're all upset about it. What Paul is saying to them is, look, there's a, there's a series of things that are going to have to occur in advance of the, the ultimate end of all things. And you don't, need to, you don't need to get all wrapped around the axle on that timetable. You just, you, you just trust uh, that uh, God's got uh, the win all worked out. The W-H-E-N all worked out and the W-I-N worked out. And um, you just know that, uh, that the day, the, the coming of the day is certain. Um, the clash between, <coughs> in this coming of the Lord, uh, also uh, Paul teaches them that the clash between the old world and the new world, that's what reveals the persecutors. That's when you're going to see the persecutors come out. So that we remember that when we stand up and do what is right and live righteously and obediently and we're gospel proclaimers and we love and trust the truth, that's just as likely to get us into trouble as it is to get us something good. And it's also important to remember that, that, that Christianity is not a benefit theology. Christianity is not a, a um, quid pro quo, you, you do a bunch of good stuff and, and God's obligated to give you a bunch, bunch of good stuff. Um, Truth telling is a blessing. Truth telling can also get you in trouble. Why does truth telling sometimes get you in trouble? People don't want to hear it. Top inch on the board. <clears throat> Aren't you just stunned by that? That people don't like to hear the truth? Sometimes I don't like to hear the truth. And so, um, <clears throat> when new creation people live in a new creation where they're going to bump up against the old creation and the and the powers and authorities within that old creation and and, and it's going to it's going to put persecution on display. Yeah. Or, 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 
some things hurt more than the truth, but right now I can't think of any. <laughs> I mean, and some things will uh, hurt more than the truth, truth, but right, right now I can't think of any. I think we've all experienced that. Um, then, um, uh, still along this, this line of the centrality of the theological idea of the coming of the Lord, uh, Christians transferred from the old world to the new world uh, and, their, and their churches, they manifest this new world right now. So some of Paul's, a lot of instruction that Paul's going to give to the churches in these two letters is watch your life. You, you ought to look different from the world. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to, the heaven ought to be revealed in the way you behave. And so we're a taste of heaven ahead of time. Uh, and so, uh, and, and in the development of the idea that the, that the church, this, this, this family of God that has suddenly appeared right here in the middle of Thessalonica is a, uh, is a manifestation, first of all, of a gospel preached by Christ-filled, Christ-focused men. One of the things that Paul's going to discuss is the legitimacy of his gospel ministry. Uh, and especially in the first letter, he's going to say to them, I didn't come here uh, as a philosopher who was looking for payment. I didn't, I didn't preach for a price. But I came here and I, and I worked among you and I loved you and I cared for you and I laid my life, I poured my life out for you and I didn't do it. And I really wouldn't take any payment for it. Because I didn't want anything to, to stand in the way of, of the, the reception of the gospel. And so Paul talks about the, <clears throat> the integrity of his gospel preaching. Uh, and then uh, also this, uh, these new creation people, by, they hear the gospel from new creation preachers and this new creation people, uh, that, that new creation life and that new creation love is going to be on display in two, two major areas. One is in a redemptive sexual ethic and in their work ethic. There's a lot of different things Paul could have talked about. But in these letters, uh, he talks about those two things. I've mentioned this before, uh, but I'll mention it again because it's, it's important to understand the letters. Even as raunchy as our culture has gotten, and our culture has gotten pretty raunchy, when you look back to, to what was allowed on the TV when you were, when you were younger or when you were a kid, what we tolerate now, um, here's something that's stunning. It doesn't hold a candle to what life was like in the first century. There were no rules. But well, there was one rule. If you were a, a male Roman citizen of a, of a uh, kind of, a, of the aristocracy, then it was against the law to do something sexual to you without without your permission or that puts you in a subordinate position. But as long as you were a, a male Roman citizen aristocrat and you wanted to do it, you could do it. You didn't <clears throat> gender, age, nothing. Um, most aberrant sexual behavior was encouraged. Being good for you. You know? And so, so first of all, you can imagine what you can kind of extrapolate what life was like. And then you can also extrapolate what a stunning demand it was to these three week old pagan Christians that Paul says the marriage bed is to be kept pure. It's one man, one woman for life. Is the, is the sexual ethic of Christians. And, 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 and then a, a context in which human sexuality was, uh, was uh, considered to be um, God-given and God-blessed and would sit at the center of the family uh, and it would be protected and valued and cared for, don't defraud uh, each other. There's, there's uh, this stunningly different sexual ethic. Um, and they were expected to begin to live that way from day one. I heard the story about a guy who started a church in the red light district in, in the Vancouver area. 
people were coming to Christ as the church was growing and he had people just coming from all different backgrounds and he had to do a lesson on uh, now do not go home from church and sleep together you can't you can't you can't do that like I know you're coming to church and meeting each other but you can't go home and sleep together and they're out there going really this news to them they just never that that was completely out of their uh, out of their context, and of course they, they wanted to respond with, with obedience, but that's that's being pretty lost, uh, and and needing to be called to a, to a completely different standard, and so that's what Paul is doing here: a completely different and redemptive sexual ethic, and a completely different work ethic. What was happening, and probably it was related to some of these issues with eschatology, is Paul has to say to them, he says it softly in the first chapter, first letter. And then more stringently in the second letter, that some of them are being lazy. They're not working. They're not taking care of the responsibilities. They're presuming upon the, upon the, the goodness of others. And it may be, although Paul never directly relates them, it's a pretty good inference that their attitude was: Jesus is coming back like next Tuesday, and so why go to work? You know, well, why bother? Our responsibilities. All this is going to be over in, in just a little bit, and so. Probably those already with a propensity for, for not taking care of their responsibilities. They were using the second coming of Christ as an excuse uh, to, to, to not work. And so Paul has to say to them in the second letter, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's a pretty good idea. It might be something we think about. Um, so, uh, sexual ethic and work, work ethic are two areas where in Paul's three weeks, the very limited time being with these Christians, he saw that these were two areas where they were really going to uh, need uh, some extra encouragement um, because they were probably had some pretty significant battles there. And so then let's look at the, at the two letters very quickly. And let me say to this, what I'm probably not going to do moving forward is go through extensive outlines of the letters. And one of the main reasons is, is because I've, I've talked too much already and I won't, I won't get through them. But also, if you'll get that New Testament survey, every chapter has a, a very detailed outline of the book, and you can refer to that. But having, a, having an outline of the whole book is very helpful, but that's all, that works already been done, and that gives me the opportunity to just drill down into, into some details. So I'm going to give you some overviews of the letters. Uh, first of all, just, just reminding you that good... Um, Principles of interpretation is you need to know the genre of whatever it is you're studying. And so the genre of uh, these uh, books of the New Testament are letters. They're epistles. In fact, in fact, uh, they're referred to specifically in these letters as epistles of friendship. First and second Thessalonians and Philippians <clears throat> are epistles of friendship. So they have a much more personal uh, nature to them. Uh, written um, about 50 AD, and that, if you, if you don't know, this is just something to know if you don't know it. CA means circa, and circa means around, uh, and around 50 AD. When we get to the uh, next week, I'm going to talk about the Corinthian correspondence. I'll, it's out of the Acts narrative of the Corinthian church that we get a historical detail that yields one of the most historically reliable dates in all of ancient history. Um, and I'll try not to nerd out on that too bad next week, but it's very interesting because it's a detail uh, that was verified by an archaeological discovery about 2,000 years later. And you dig something up and it, and it verifies and the archaeological discovery yields a date. And so one of the most certain dates of all ancient history of any kind is that Paul was in Corinth in 51 and 52 AD. And so from that then you can then you can prognosticate about where you know where he was in different places. It's really really pretty pretty nifty. And so since Paul was in Pretty sure he was in Corinth. He might have been in Athens, but he'll say in First um, Thessalonians three one. So we couldn't. Uh, we, we we were waiting in Athens, but the sense of the of the Greek is that we waited, but we've left. Uh, we were in Athens waiting to hear about you guys, and and uh, 
Very likely what Paul did is he sent Timothy back up to Thessalonica to get a report. And then when Timothy came back, they had already gone on to Corinth. Corinth and Athens were real close together. So uh, Paul writes, probably wrote the letter from Corinth. Uh, the occasion, um, uh, and, and that's just a, uh, that's a fancy word for what was the reason for the writing of the letter. And the reason for the writing of the letter, uh, one is just, just for personal check. He's worried about it. He just was worried about it. And, uh, and part of the reason why he was worried about it, he says, I was orphaned. That's, that's one of the words he'll use in 1 Thessalonians. And, and, and he was there for three weeks and then suddenly he had to go. So he had to sort of drop everything and run. So he's worried about them. Uh, he's, and, and thanking them and expressing his, his personal affection for them. Um, the other thing he's doing is he's giving them lots of reminders. I think it's 11 times in 1 Thessalonians he said he says something like, like I told you or like I, like I instructed you. So he's just reminding them. And, they, and once again, because he was only there for three weeks, and he taught them everything he could teach them in three weeks, but he's just going back through and reinforcing these things because he didn't get to spend a lot of time with them. And then the third reason for the writing of the letter is Timothy has gone and checked on him, and Timothy has brought back a report, a pretty good report, and so he's just in this letter, Timothy reported these things, and I feel so good, I'm so excited. He was concerned about these two little areas, and so let me give you some more encouragement about them. Um, and then the themes, there's just really three things that you can look for, persecution, right behavior, and the coming of the Lord already gone through all, all of those things, but you'll see uh, all of those things in succession. And then the prominent text that we all tend to want to talk about or be interested in is this instruction about the second coming, especially this idea of meeting the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18. through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who fall asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, very often this passage of Scripture is used to be the nail in the, uh, in the argument about the rapture. That the reason for the rapture is this text. Okay? I think it's unlikely that Paul is teaching about the rapture in this text. And I, I say that because it's um, even for doctrines and things that we like to think about, we, we need to always be careful about reading something into a text. That's called eisegesis. We need to let, always let the authors of the Bible say what they want to say, not what we want them to say. Now here's, and I'm, and I'm giving you some bonus level thinking about biblical interpretation. I'm not saying this text rules out the idea of rapture. But we often have people do this. They'll say, this text proves the phenomena of the rapture. And what I'm saying to you is I think the evidence of the words themselves uh, support a different, that, that Paul is, it, it's very unlikely <coughs> that Paul is teaching specifically about the rapture in this text. Mostly because, man, that's a, that's a heavy load of information in a, in a half of a verse. <clears throat> okay? And the sometimes reading in something that we want to be there because we're looking for evidence of it uh, is uh, it, it obscures or causes us to miss the, the, the main meaning that Paul is trying to bring across when he's given this instruction. All right? So it's much more likely that the center of what Paul is speaking about is um, J 
just that he is referring to the coming of the Lord, right? So this is about the second coming. This is totally about the second coming. Uh, and when he says, um, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. This is imagery from um, Exodus, where Moses comes down from the mountain, and there's this, there's a trumpet blast, and there's a voice uh, that's, that, uh, that's, uh, that uh, is sounds forth. Um, and, and so it's this picture of the of the, uh, the spokesman of God coming down from on high with the revelation of God uh, coming back down to see what's going on. So that's strong Exodus imagery there. Uh, and then um, it's also Daniel 7 language. The, the Son of Man in the clouds uh, and the one who appears before the Ancient of Days to rule over the earth. And then it's the imagery of um, uh, uh, being caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That word for meet uh, typically refers to or, or is used when um, the king was coming back to the city and a delegation would be sent out to go meet the king. Uh, almost the idea of lining the roadways to cheer the king in as the king returns. And so you go and meet him, but you don't stay out there outside of the city. You meet uh, the king, and then you, then you come come back, or, or you, you, you come home with him. Um, and then, and, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So that's likely the imagery. It's, it's really imagery and affirmation of that, of the final return and descent <clears throat> of, the, of, of the new creation, of the new Jerusalem, in that final act. All right. What do you think about that? Because I find sometimes when I teach on this this thing, uh, maybe not being your dead bang proof of the rapture, people don't like that. And what I'm not teaching is that this first rules rapture out. So y'all follow what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's very likely that Paul had sat down with the Thessalonians and really worked them through end times eschatology that included second coming and rapture and, and those, those sorts of details. So you're saying this is more of the second coming? Yes. And the rapture would have been or prior to this? If it says the dead would rise first, that's, that's when, he's, when he's coming back to get us all out of here. Yeah, here, here you go. You're so, you're so follow what I'm saying. You have to go get Revelation, the book of Revelation, which was probably written. This is this is written in 50. Revelation is probably written in 90. And you gotta. It's it's sort of our work as as theologians of a later day to sit down and see if we can put all put all these pieces together. But what you don't need to do to make because, have you noticed that sometimes Christians argue about end time stuff? <laughs> ever, ever notice we can get... Okay? Um, because uh, the... Um, I can have someone sit and make an argument for mid-trib premillennialism. I can have, you know, post-trib. We can all, you know, get our verses out, that kind of thing. And that's it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm a theologian. I love the theological discussion. And uh, for things like Trinity, you don't get to have multiple opinions on Trinity. <laughs> for uh, the um, resurrection. resurrection and for the divinity and humanity of Christ, those are not those are not negotiable. But end time stuff, it is what is second tier. So there we can have a variety of opinions about the details of the second coming of Christ, rapture, the millennial kingdom, the role of Israel, all of those sorts of things. But we can still be members of the same church, uh, friends, go on mission trips together, plant churches together, love one another, and just, and somebody's going to find out they're right when Jesus comes back. <laughs> you know? And you can, you, and you can tell everybody else, see, I told you so. But what I, what I find does not help and often causes dissension between Christians is when 
texts are used as battering rams, and, and people will point out and say, Doof! you know, and so if you don't hold my view, you don't believe the Bible. And man, that, that's not good. Unless you're pointing to a text like there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. <laughs> there it is, you know, and if you're a, if you're a, a uh, you don't believe in the exclusivity of salvation through Jesus, you and I just have a, a, an unresolvable theological problem. That's not going to work. Um, so, uh, but, you, but here's what I'm trying to uh, remind you of as students of the Bible, is you, is you have to let the text Say what it says. And you can't take things that you would like to see and read them back <coughs> in the text. Or take a whole well-developed theological idea and then say, see, Paul believes just like I believe about uh, some of these end times details. And then since Paul believes it, if you don't believe it, then you don't believe it. And you see how the, the argumentation flows from there. All right? Okay. If you're thinking what it's going to be and you're not right, then that means it's going to be better than what you think it's going to be. Sure, sure. And you, you heard the old joke about being a pan millennial, pan millennialist. Uh, just it's all going to pan out in the end. Uh, the 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 good news is, however it, whatever shape it takes, I promise you, you're going to be very happy uh, if, if you know Jesus, and you'll be very unhappy uh, if you don't. Uh, but the point Paul is making, and I want to encourage all of you, and, and this would be a non-negotiable. Um, Jesus is returning bodily one day to bring history to its conclusion and to bring the new creation and to judge the living and the dead. Yes or no? Yes. Not negotiable. And if you think, ah, that all that ends, that's just kind of a metaphor for let's all get better and better. Nope. Because you can't read 1 Thessalonians and draw that conclusion. Paul only says, uh, talks about the coming of the Lord in every chapter, over and over and over again. And so with a little help, because we'll, now I'm going to flip the script, because in 2 Thessalonians, and I'm going to, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are all wild alike. And so, because I'm running out of time, I'll just squash this part down. Persecution. Uh, behaving like Christians and the end times are also the themes of 2 Thessalonians. And if there's any difference, it's uh, the first letter didn't take. <laughs> and so Paul sends Timothy back to the church and they seem to have gotten a little bit worse in these areas. And so Paul is, is just going back over it again uh, with them. And so um, you know, persecution has gotten worse and Paul is just encouraging them. Uh, and then getting messed up about the, the end times. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul will say, some people are going around, and they're even saying, I said this, that the, that the coming of the Lord has already happened. Now, because they know what they're talking about, and Paul knows what they're thinking, he doesn't give us any more detail. And I would love to know exactly what it was they had been told about the coming of the Lord has already happened. Because Paul doesn't tell us any more about that, I'm assuming that what he meant was people are telling them Jesus has come back to bring in his kingdom and you got left out. I think that's what they're saying. And which is obviously very upsetting to them. And so uh, Paul uh, says to them uh, that's not true. And one of, the, <coughs> one of the main reasons it's not true is because there are some things that do have to happen. And so Paul will speak very specifically of the man of lawlessness. And I think it is a um, very reasonable inference to understand the man of lawlessness and the Antichrist as the same person. Even though Paul doesn't use Antichrist, he uses a very, it's kind of odd terms, the man of lawlessness, because that doesn't really show up, show up anywhere else. But I do think in that in that timetable of the end times, the role that the, that the Antichrist plays is what Paul is referring to. All right? And so, uh, and so what, who is the man of lawlessness? And here's another, I'm throwing a whole lot at you. When in doubt about what Paul's talking about, look to the Old Testament. 
because he probably has an Old Testament reference that he's, that he's using to help talk this through. And so what you have in the Old Testament are the figures of the of Nebuchadnezzar, um, Darius, um, Artaxerxes, these figures who rise up. They're the emperors of a foreign army. Um, yeah, uh, well, Cyrus probably wouldn't fit into that category because Cyrus is actually good to the people of, 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 of Israel. But Asher Banipal and uh, Tiglath Pileser, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, all the way back to Pharaoh. So probably the, the, the uh, paradigm for the Antichrist is Pharaoh. Uh, the very powerful head of the most powerful. Um, empire of the old world who's kind of lost his mind and what you find and it's very, isn't it very interesting that one of the manifestations of the Antichrist is they really want to kill Jews they, it's a, it has a it has a strange almost supernatural they don't like Jesus, they don't like God's chosen people they just, that's always it's so interesting that even 2,000 years later, the, and I'm not saying that Hitler was the Antichrist, that's not my point, but you have these people who are prefiguring this the, kind of this ultimate opponent. Uh, and behind, and who is always behind the Antichrist? And this is really pictured in the book of Revelation. Who's Satan. always Satan. back there? <laughs> right. Red Red right. The, 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 he is simply a representative of the ultimate opponent of God, which is Satan himself. And I, I think part of what this is pointing to, or, or part, part of the message of this reminder that this man of lawlessness must, must appear is, um, do not be surprised at how bonkers the enemies of God will get. There really is no other than the limiting power of God himself. There's no limit to what the haters of God will do to destroy the work of God. I think that's always good to remember. Because uh, a process that, that the Antichrist will always enter into is one of compromise. Hey, if you Christians would just, you know, kind of let us do our thing, kind of buy in. We'll be good to you. We'll, you know, we'll cut us a deal. Don't you believe it? Um, and so, one of the things that encourages then these persecuted Christians is, I know it's hard, and it seems to be getting worse, and it will get worse because that's what happens. It's, that's, that's what happens. It gets bad. But at the moment, and ultimately at the moment when it seems darkest and most overwhelming, the, uh, the Son of Man will appear, the Christ will appear, and always the picture in Daniel and in, in, in other places in the Old Testament, especially this is, this is true in Daniel, it's bad, 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 bad. You know, you'll have these series of kingdoms and one's go. Y'all just did Daniel in some of your Sunday classes, right? So it's a series of kingdoms and one seems to be worse than the next. And Oh my goodness. And then the Son of Man appears back. It's over. There's not a long description of this long process where the, where the, uh, where, where, uh, the Messiah has to get the upper hand. He shows up, sword of his mouth. It's, it's over. Just like that. Nobody, there won't be any doubt about it. There won't be any ambivalence. Maybe, maybe not. He comes. It's over. Um, but there are these historical processes that are that are unfolding, uh, that are a part of God's God's plan, and and some of it has to do. Paul doesn't speak about it specifically here, but always the question is why? Why? It's what the, it's what the um, Witnesses or the martyrs that are there at the, at the throne in Revelation, what, what question are they asking? How long? How, how long is it going on? Right? Mm -hmm. And what really is the, is the biblical response when we say, How long, O Lord? 
But why, why is there a delay? He's a long he's day, too. So he's taking his time. Right. It's not slow as, as we count slow. I think that's what it says in First or Second Peter. God's, God's given us. He's going he's gonna to give people as much time as he possibly can so that they can come to faith. And so that we can go out and tell them. But here's what, what I want to say. is While I'm not someone who says you can sit and plot every little, this historical detail is this thing that I, I see in the scriptures. I, I think that's that has a long history of 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 88. 89 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 89. I think, I think there's a ditch you don't want to get into. But the other ditch is to say this is all just this is all just metaphor and and kind of a, a psychological description. And I'll tell you what it is, what hammers that through for me, that there really is a historical process and some historical events that must occur is um, <clears throat> the reemergence of Israel in, in, in 48. Who could have predicted that? A nation that is not a nation for 2,000 years and suddenly it is one? And you don't think there's a clock that that God's in charge of and that there that there are that he is not managing the, the affairs of the nations of the world uh, in order to bring about his ultimate purposes and, and it doesn't have a historical reference to it I go to Israel and, and learn the, learn how all that unfolded you know there's none of the prophecies that he said was going to happen they all happened yep. Every one of them's happened. There's not been one of them that did not happen. So why would we, you know, why would you want to make believe that the rest of, you know, the rest of stuff that happened to us, everything's happened just, and just the way that's what we've all said, it's just what it's going to happen. You know, this part, the part of, it is, is for free as well. While Paul envisioned a Jew Gentile family of faith and, and, and profound unity, he still did not envision a time when there were no Jews or that time where God did not have a unique role for Jewish people to play. We'll hit some of that when we get to Romans, especially Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I think, I don't think, because I wrote a long paper on this, I think Paul's point specifically is the Jews continue to bear a role, this strange role of profound persecution. And it's bound up with the ultimate Jew, which is Jesus. And we don't understand all of it. But it, do a study the history of the persecution of the Jews. It, it just, they're, they've got a special assignment. I'm sorry, and it is an assignment to be persecuted. Because you would think, it, why would we leave them alone? But, but that really is my that really is my question. I, I, you know, out of all the people we could kick around, we seem to not be able to leave them alone. And we have kicked them around ceaselessly. In fact, there are, because I try to track down what happened to the Jews between about 580 and 1,000 AD, because it was about a 500 year period. Because you, you get this huge Jewish population in Europe. So where do the Jew, where do the European Jews really come from? And I'm a pretty good researcher, and maybe some of you have some answers. And I, and I got some I got some tentative answers, but the truth is, to a large degree, there's about five to eight hundred years of Jewish history that's just it's just missing. It's just missing. They were that persecuted. And a bunch of them were in Spain, and then 800 years later, there are none in Spain, and they're all in Poland. And nobody seems to know what happened. And so, you may think, what in the world is he talking about? What I'm saying is, it's, it's this tension between one ditch being there's, no, there's nothing to know, there's no details, there's no geopolitical grand plan going on. And the, the other ditch is the Bible gives us a travel log of, of detail such that we can point to one specific event and, and say that thing is this thing. And there, there's 
There's a long history of that not going well. People making predictions about what year is going to happen or uh, that sort of thing. It doesn't. It's not a. It's not a good way to do it. Uh, but Jesus is the Lord of history. He's working in history. He's working specifically in the history of the Jewish people, and he's working specifically through the people of Israel. And I don't know how specifically how it's all going to look, but it, whatever the end can, how this unfolds, Israel will be a part of it. Because God is, and, and a man of lawlessness is going to be a part of it. And, and then we're, when we get to the book of Revelation, of course, we can, we can go into a lot more of this detail. As well. So, let me say my final, finalist thing about 2 Thessalonians. Um, I'll break over. Okay, so next week is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians and then an introduction to what's called the Corinthian Correspondence. Because there's actually five letters that pass back and forth between Paul and the Corinthian church. We have two of them, and then there are, the others are referred to. And so I'll give you a little intro to that, and then we'll start the first one. I'm your prayer. Now let's go. Father, we thank you that you have revealed to us that truly one day uh, Christ will return. And when he does, those of us who are in Christ, we really will rejoice. And you will, you will displace the old world with a, with a new one. You will replace the, the old earth with a new heaven and a new earth. And we will be with you forever. And for all of those who are in Christ, we will be together forever. And it is comforting to know that. God, help us to live as though we really believe that the end has already been written. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid uh, and we don't need to hold on to the things of this world very tightly because all of that's going to pass away. And we want to have our arms open to the new things that you're bringing into being because of Jesus. Help us to live like that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.